Hi everyone. Um, on behalf of Life APAC, Sydney, Hong Kong, and Singapore, I welcome you all. Uh, thanks for joining, and most of all, thanks for the panelists to accept our invitation to talk to our webinar today, which is going to be dedicated to the humanitarian actions um, from Life in Lebanon. Um, before starting, um, I would like to as well um, uh, thank the. Um, the, the part of the organization that helped us to raise a lot of um, funds that were generously and sometimes anonymously coming from Asia. Uh, I think it's something that we were all surprised that not only from Lebanese, we were having non-Lebanese people joining the, um, the, the, um, uh, the charity and the fund that were raised. And I think something we would like to highlight as well. Um, a lot of efforts were done from the life committees and the life members as well that were all mobilized. Um, at some stage, definitely we were following what was happening um, and we have regular updates, but we wanted uh, via this webinar to hear from the people on the grounds. That mean, that's why we have a sample of NGOs that gonna participate uh, to explain to us what was happening and what is still happening on the ground. I know situation is not that easy and probably to hear from people that were there i think we salute your efforts um but we'll be happy to to hear um to hear from you on that um quick update on the situation and i'm not sure it's something that um it's known already for a lot of people that lebanon is facing a multi-facelet um crisis i know each one of them is not unique but to have all of them in one place in one year is kind of unique um we have the uh, political crisis that we'll leave it aside. Then we'll have the economic, economic disaster going on that was not starting since last year. Um, we have a complete disaster on the economy. Um, if we look to the recent um, World Bank figures, um, 2020, we have almost money 30% on our GDP. Unemployment is um, it is going off the roof to almost 40%, and even 50% on the young people. Uh, we have the monetary uh, crisis and the currency in free fall. Um, I, would, I would like, I mean, we can add a lot of other crises going on, including the, the depositors not being able to access their savings. And of course, COVID. And on top of that, we had the, the Beirut blast. Um, I think um, no country ever had this kind of crisis in one year. Uh, that all um, were, were happening in a situation where Unfortunately, we don't have any government or any official organization on the grounds. Uh, uh, I think the NGO response shamed all of organization how fast they were to, to, to actually um, act on the ground um, and to be able to have a quick response. And from what we can see on the ground that actually there has an impact. And we're happy to see some of our efforts were translated into direct impact on, on, on the ground. So before starting, let me give you um, a quick, uh, um, I'll try a bit to structure the webinar um, for the next 40 minutes. Um, so we will have a, um, an update from Tara. She works at 3QA. They will update us on um, the NGOs. As you know, that our, the NGOs that were selected were going through a very strict due diligence to make sure um, the NGOs that were having access to the funds um, have a, a, a very detailed project of implementation um, and all what goes through the due diligence. I'll leave that part to Tara that will explain to us um, what are the NGOs, how was selected, and as well give us an insight on the current situation and the need beyond, beyond Beirut Blast. Because as we're mentioning, um, the BF, which is Beirut Emergency Fund, was meant to, to, to answer a quick response to what's happening uh, after the blast, but actually the need um, is increasing and the, and the absence of, of government um, is pushing the social society to step up and take action on that. Uh, from the um, two NGOs, and we will have Baitna Baitak, um, Maroon will be, will be discussing that and will be reporting on the rebuilding projects that are undertaking and how helping uh, the micro business of SME across Lebanon. Then we'll have Noor uh, from Lebanon Needs. Um, we'll cover the medical and healthcare angle, including COVID and the exodus of 
professionals. Um, at the end of, um, of that, we'll have Zena. She will also speak about the other life project that goes beyond, definitely humanitarian, but beyond humanitarian in education and job creation to support um, local businesses. Um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to go to the Q&A sections below, ask questions, I'll make sure to, to, to ask them to the, uh, to the panelists. Um, let's start with, with, with Tara. Tara, thanks for joining. Um, thanks for, for being there from the first to help us on the, uh, on the NGO selections. Um, so, um, so, um, a quick bio about Tara. So, sorry, I need to find something. Anyway, so Tara works with 3QA. She has been 10 years working with, um, with them. Uh, she's, I think, founding partner, partner as well of 3QA. Um, Tara, please, um, what do you think about, uh, I mean, let's, can you present a bit properly 3QA and from there explain to us the, the process that you had to work with LIFE and probably work with other organization, but probably the, the, um, the section that when you start working with LIFE, this NGO selections and probably some situation on the ground. Thank you, Rawat. Thanks a lot. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Tara Hermes, and I'm the CEO of 3QA. Uh, 3QA is a Lebanon-based social enterprise. Uh, we started around three years ago, uh, and the main focus was to guide and support donors, the international community, in identifying local organizations uh, that are doing great work, uh, but uh, needed to adhere to international standards of compliance. And when we talk about compliance, it's uh, on several different tiers. We have with us Maroon and Noor who went through uh, our rigorous due diligence process that uh, basically uh, looks over different elements that have to do with governance. So when we talk about governance, we're talking about a board, we're talking about a non-political, non-religious and uh, independent board, which is something that Sometimes we struggle with in Lebanon due to the lack of, um, you know, uh, um, government regulations around what's expected and required from the nonprofit sector. Financials, everything needs to be set in place with audit reports that, you know, are coming from independent entities. Moving on to, you know, how you do your work on the ground from monitoring and evaluation. So we take this holistic look at the organization to ensure that the donors are supporting those that are not just active on the ground, but are also credible and transparent. This is a big challenge in Lebanon because culturally we work as a, a mom and pop shop approach to things, you know, especially in the charity sector. So the levels of accountability are not always clear and they're not expected. But when we start thinking about the international community, especially those that live outside, including yourselves, uh, that don't know, you know, who Nur Najm is, but would like to support Lebanon needs, they need to go through an independent assessment in order to justify that this organization is actually legitimate and uh, transparent. Uh, ever since, even before the blast, actually, LIFE launched a series of emergency funds because as Rawad uh, echoed, we've been going through a series of unfortunate events in Lebanon, whether it was with the financial crisis or with the COVID uh, pandemic, and then leading up until the blast uh, in Beirut. So uh, what we've done is we've been supporting life on identifying, you know, first, what are the sectors to intervene in? And I think this is something that uh, we need to uh, always reevaluate and reassess because today uh, we have multiple sectors that are in need and we cannot um, shed light on one and support one without taking into consideration what the implications are on the rest. Uh, so during the first two emergency responses that LIFE led, we focused mainly on the sectors of, of food security, health, and um, some sort of livelihood intervention by you know, promoting organizations that work within this field came the Beirut blast and, and, and the Beirut Emergency Fund was launched with a group of different partners, including SEAL uh, and others. Um, overall, the emergency response for Beirut was great, but everyone assumes that, you know, it was good enough. It was nowhere close. And this is something that I'd like to sort of 
um, focus on today, you know, with all of you attending that the situation in Lebanon uh, is, is beyond what we've ever seen before. Uh, even previous generations say that even during the war, we haven't seen this level of hunger. We haven't seen this level of, um, of desperacy for whether it's a job, whether it's uh, safety, whether it's living in dignity. Um, with everything that has been, that, that has been taken place, uh, we now more than ever need the support and we need to move beyond humanitarian aid. We can't keep giving food kits. We can't keep, you know, just putting a plaster on the situation. We need to start thinking about sustainable solutions. First and foremost, to introduce a new generation that is actually active and actually wants to work, which is something that's not the case right now. Everyone has become extremely uh, hopeless and all they do is sit around and wait for support to come through because there are no opportunities. And I know life and Zena will speak about, you know, the job creation component of uh, the programs that, that, that they've launched and the initiatives that they've partnered with. But this is something that we really need to be mindful of when we want to give and when we want to support Lebanon. What are the ways in which we're introducing some sort of skill, some sort of opportunity in order for people to rely less on aid and to rely more on themselves? Um, of course, we need to be mindful of when we do support, we support in a way that is uh, studied, it's uh, carefully assessed. And this is where 3QA comes in. So we've guided individual donors, we've guided foundations, and we've got guided international organizations on also the damage of AIDS at times, right? So it comes, there's always an opportunity and a disadvantage when it comes to how you support, who you support, and the way you do so. Um, so uh, with the Beirut Emergency Fund, they've tackled on different sectors. They've touched upon the health sector, which Noor will, uh, will elaborate on further. Maroon, who uh, runs Beit Nabaitak, focusing on rehabilitation, and now looking into also job creation and providing skills to the youth in order for them to feel a sense of responsibility for the community, for their families, and for others. Uh, other organizations that were supported included Himaya for child protection. We had Embrace for the suicide hotline. Um, we had Bet Baraka that worked uh, mainly in the scope of elderly, but also in the scope of rehabilitation and actually providing dignity for a sector of the population that is has absolutely no wealth welfare or no pension funds available. So the, well, the elderly are actually one of the most vulnerable groups today uh, that we see across the country that really are extremely hopeless because even by providing with them with skills, they're not gonna be able to work because they've reached a certain age. Uh, so uh, the beauty of the way uh, the Beirut Emergency Fund uh, took place was that they made sure that they don't leave any sector behind. And they actually attend to all of the sectors that were heavily affected by the blast and the aftermath of the blast. Moving forward, we think about 2021. We need to think about what we can do collectively to continue to show our solidarity to the communities in need where we have over 60% of the population that's dropped under the poverty line with almost 30% of it in extreme poverty. Um, it's shocking really to see what has taken place and the absence of the government is extremely disappointing, but we can't continue to dwell on it. We need to get up on our feet and we need to think about the ways in which we will continue despite all the obstacles that we're being faced with on a daily basis. So. Um, I'm happy to uh, expand on anything uh, further on. Uh, I don't want to take too much of everyone's time, but uh, as well, um, I think that uh, LIFE will be able to provide my contact details if anyone wants to get in touch and learn more about how we do things, um, the details of the due diligence and the monitoring which takes place once the organizations have been selected to ensure that every penny that has been donated is actually reported on, is actually justified through supporting evidence in order to assure that uh, we're on the ground with these organizations doing good work with the money that you've, you've donated. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, Dara. Actually, I have a quick question for you there. I mean, th thanks, thanks for, for the insights. 
and I, I hear I hear the sadness in the way that we we still have a lot of things to do, and unfortunately, definitely, I mean, the the the, um, the BF was a good start, and I think we're all collectively proud because we're still individual that will be able to rise 8.2 million. I think it is it is something very solid, but I know the needs are much more than that. Um, I have a quick question on, on that, if you allow me to. Do, do we have other, I mean, other than life, do you have other like official organization, I mean, international ones coming to help these kind of NGOs or it's still all locally supported? So um, are there, there are international organizations that include the UN, Save the Children and so on and so forth. But uh, um, unfortunately, with the funding appeals that came out, the priority wasn't uh, fulfilled and the needs weren't fulfilled on behalf of them. So a lot of them pledged, you know, the hundreds of thousands and strategy and uh, did a report on this to show the gaps and really what was expected in the different sectors, whether rehabilitation, education, hospital support. And we're talking about not even 10% that had been met up until today. Uh, other entities that were active included uh, Impact, for example, that raised around 10 million. They aren't a um, uh, international organization. They were based on a, uh, a crowdfunder that came up and they were actually the first to respond to the blast at the time and set up uh, a platform for that. You have other foundations that we're talking in the millions. And this is, yes, you think about a million dollars and you think it's a lot, but it's really a drop in the ocean in terms of the billions that are needed, whether it's to reconstruct uh, the port, whether to equip the schools and the hospitals so that they can go back to the way they are, or even for them to be able to continue. Because you need to understand today that it's not just about the actual uh, core and shell, it's also about the human resources. And I think Noor is gonna ex like expand on how much we're losing from the skilled Lebanese in Lebanon in these different sectors. Sector of education is drowning today. Teachers are being paid nowhere close to what they're expected to pay with less than $300 uh, of income monthly. So there's a very, very high level of demotivation from the side of uh, the labor force. Uh, so when we want to think about the gaps, we need to think about them in, I think maybe I can put them in threefold. The first is the gap when it comes to human resources and when it comes to expertise on the ground uh, to be able to respond, whether, <clears throat> excuse me, whether on the side of the healthcare, whether on the side of education, whether on the side of even livelihoods and job creation, then you have the reconstruction efforts that are ongoing, but are nowhere close to being fulfilled. And within the reconstruction efforts, we need to also take something into account is that a lot of uh, funders focus on the very vulnerable and they leave out the middle class. And this is something that I think Beitna Beitak has been doing a great job at attending to. And they always put their foot down and say, Tara, we, they are all vulnerable today. The middle class, as you mentioned, Rawad, don't even have their money or access to it, right? Uh, when you want to rebuild today, glass is in fresh, ca fresh cash is also another term that we have to deal with, which is, you know, the actual hard currency of, of cash dollars. Rebuilding your homes cannot be done without actually having access to the hard currency that's restricted from them. So we've, and this middle class is the actual class today. That's the working class as well, alongside the lower class. If we neglect them, then we're also pushing them away and encouraging them to leave as well. Uh, and then we're going to be left with a void where who's left in the country to actually keep it going. We need the educated. We need those that are skilled to remain behind in order for us to rebuild for the next generations to come. Thanks, Tara. Um, enlightening and useful as well for us that we are very aware. I mean, we 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 hear what's happening on the ground, but to hear uh, the sadness of the situation, I think it's it's very worrying. Unfortunately, I mean, definitely we're still mobilized to to be there, but uh, at certain extent, I think um, I don't know if we can replace uh, completely the government and have fully support of the population and as you mentioned the creation of job and everything it's kind of saying okay let's replace every official institution and we'll we'll do it i know their efforts are there but as you mentioned the capital and the habit of human resources and the task force probably 
uh, is another challenge. Um, let me go to, to, uh, to Maroon. Maroon Karam is, um, thanks for joining Maroon. Maroon is the co-founder and president of Baitna Baitak, uh, Our Home is Your Home, um, based in Beirut, Lebanon. Um, initially established to help the healthcare frontline and then moved to the new challenge and rebuilding Beirut after the, the blast. Um, Baitna Baitak is household symbol of hope and positivity in, in Beirut. Uh, Maroon, I'll leave it for you to explain. I mean, thanks, thanks for joining Maroon. Um, if you can uh, talk to the, a bit about Baitna Baitak, uh, what happened since last year, what is the projects, and what is actually the situation on the ground? Yeah, first, thank you a lot for having me and thanks for everybody uh, attending this webinar. Uh, my name is Maroon Karam, I'm the co-founder and the president of Baitna Baitak. So technically today, one year ago, exactly today, one year ago, we started Baitna Baitak uh, helping the medical heroes. We provided the medical heroes with alternative housing. So in order to stay safe uh, during the pandemic. Uh, we secured around 900 houses for 900 medical heroes. When I say medical heroes, I mean Red Cross people, nurses, and doctors uh, in all over Lebanon. We focused in the, at the beginning in Beirut, but uh, with uh, the pandemic growth, uh, we expanded to Tripoli, Zahle, uh, Saida, Matin, and Kisrawain areas, so all over Lebanon. Uh, and uh, three of uh, August 3rd, uh, we stopped the operation of accommodation because we ran, we ran, we ran out, out of funds. Uh, 4th of August, the blast happened. Uh, and automatically the people uh, called us, guys, you have to do something. You are, you, your name is, your house is uh, Beit Nabait, like my, house, my home is your home. So uh, we started, we started uh, the base camp initiative along with many initiatives. Uh, and we focused on the rehabilitation uh, side. Uh, till now, we, uh, we have 900, 946 uh, houses in full rehabilitation. As well, we worked in uh, business uh, rehabilitation along with uh, Li Beirut and House of Christmas. We helped 68 businesses and now we're taking with life a new program as well to help more businesses. Uh, and this is mainly our main, uh, main focus in the past six months. So uh, now, uh, now there is many challenges that we are having now, uh, especially with the, uh, with the government. Today, we got the rejection from uh, the FER. They didn't give us the permits to work. Uh, they need the full data of, uh, of the houses. Uh, I just finished the call with General Hwayik and I told him, we, people needs us, so we'll continue working. And if you gave us uh, fines, so we'll not pay them, but we are working. So now the team is on the ground. We are helping the people because there is a huge need in rehabilitation. There is, um, uh, you cannot imagine how much uh, left in rehabilitation. So as well, th there is many challenges. Like Tara said, the fresh dollars now, you can't, uh, you can't have access to your fresh dollars. As well, the raw materials are very ex expensive and as well, paid in fresh dollars. So it's another uh, challenge for us in Beitna Beitag, uh, as well the pandemic. The team is uh, 105 uh, team members. We, have, we started two founders and now we are 105 between engineers, painters, administrative team, uh, auditing team and marketing team. And uh, today we will post that we are recruiting more 30 engineers because uh, we're taking more program with life. Thank you guys for your support and your trust. As well, uh, we are expanding uh, to, uh, to other areas. Uh, we're going to Zahli, to Tripoli, to Saida. We are working on many job creations and sustainability projects. Uh, I'll talk later on, uh, on, this, uh, on this specifically. I have to mention that we worked with Noor, Najem, Lebanon Needs on a very uh, a beautiful collaboration when it comes to the uh, oxygen concentrators and all the pandemic, uh, let's say, uh, needs. Uh, medical needs. Uh, we secured 350 oxygen machines. Lebanon needs uh, help us a lot in, uh, when, when it comes to the trainings, to the fundings. And now we secured all over Lebanon. We are uh, in 180 municipalities. We gave them trainings, we gave them machines, and now Lebanon is safe when it comes to the oxygen machines. Noor will talk more about uh, this uh, as well. So, so now Beta Beitak uh, is focusing on the rehabilitation be because we are 
mastering it when it comes to uh, cost uh, cost efficiency when it comes to uh, speed as well for the uh, we are totally result oriented when it comes to reconstruction uh, we're uh, we're collaborating with the uh, house of christmas now like i said an atiyah factory it's a, it's the oldest chocolate factory in beirut we are rebuilding the the chocolate factory as well we are working on the business development side with the help of uh, Christ, uh, house of christmas we're uh, we're working on the export we're, we're working on the social media presence on many uh, revenue models that they can have uh beitna beitak uh, beitna beitak now is working on on many we will take many uh, an intensive program when it comes to crisis management with international ngos and government uh, and uh, government organizations because after the beirut blast with 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 you know, uh, we took uh, a lot of experience when it comes to the management and the crisis management but we need to share it with the whole world so we're taking many uh, now many programs with uh, international ngos and we're looking forward hopefully in the future to intervene where uh, where there is an intervention uh, international crisis so we might go and help as well uh, our next projects now we have a project very nice project in zahli uh, we're working on a livelihood project we will create uh, 50 businesses uh, to Zahli people. Uh, well now we're doing the ground study, we're sitting with the civil society, with the public sector, with the private sector, in order to assess the needs, and then we'll start these businesses. And day by day, the, the people who will be working in this project will have the ownership of this project, will become shareholders. So at the beginning, they will take, let's say, a salary, a small salary or a specific salary, but by the time, if the business... Uh, uh, well, he, he will be uh, generating money and everything is great. So they will become shareholders. Uh, now our focus is sustainability when it comes to uh, job creations as well. Uh, now we're studying in, uh, we're studying, uh, we're doing a study about the education because a lot of uh, students cannot pay now the tuition fees in the Lebanese uh, university or as well uh, in the private, private universities. And... Uh, we don't have a specific mission right now because everybody is telling us, okay, guys, you're so efficient, please help us. But uh, now we're, we're, we're putting our mission, clear, we're putting a clear mission and a clear vision in order to, to know where to work on. But for example, now uh, our main mission is to help in terms of crisis. And in Lebanon, there is always a crisis in terms of economic crisis, uh, educational crisis. So that's it. Thanks, Maroon. Thanks, Maroon. Actually, it's very courageous what you're doing, guys. I mean, we're proud of you because you are the one on the ground. Uh, we're all having Lebanon in our hearts. I mean, but we're very far. Uh, but when you see people like you taking the lead and replacing completely the government and all, any other official institution, I mean, it, it is shaming everyone else on, from the public society. I mean, not, uh, outside the public society. Um, when you mentioned about efficiency, and I'm, I'm sure that I mean, you mentioned a lot of projects going from construction rehabilitation, now creating jobs with, within the uh, SME, uh, education, um, a lot of things on your plate. I mean, how, how can you make sure that you're still efficient uh, on every one of them? So, so basically in our structure, we have uh, the project manager for every pro, uh, program, as well we have head of program in reconstruction, head of program in business development. Uh, Radi Ghanim joined us last week. Uh, he's a senior consultant in a, a company in Dubai. He resigned and he came back to Lebanon to help Beit So we're, we're getting the human resources needed in order to provide, uh, to, to be the best and to be efficient in all these projects. What about? I mean, uh, it's you touch up. I mean, on the on the fresh dollar, I think it's it's uh, it's a common issue not only for the NGOs but everyone who's who's not able to access the hard hard cash to be able to import raw materials and so on. But you mentioned something that very um, ironic, I would say, that about the pushback from the government whenever you need it. Uh, um, do do you feel like there's a pushback from government municipalities whenever you're going on the ground? I, I'm, I'm yeah. Not, yeah politically but speaking about difficulties you might have so, so basically they are not helping us at all to be very honest we're having many troubles with them they, they come to the base camp uh, on a daily basis telling us why you are open we, we are saying we are giving oxygen machines guys we are giving oxygen check the oxygen machines uh, so they are not helping us at all especially the FER we are helping the FER literally and we are giving them money to help families their families so we're helping as much as possible but uh, 
the response was uh, very uh, very bad from from their side i want to mention one thing as well uh, till now we created 700 job opportunities in beit nabeita between engineers painter painters and contractors so uh, and they are they are all uh, small businesses we didn't we didn't take any big uh, enterprises or companies. We focused on getting small contractors, uh, fresh grads, engineers, with small uh, senior engineers in order to supervise the work. So we create about we we, uh, we focus on job creations as well as well on empowering the youth. Excellent, uh, Maroon. One last question for you. You know, probably myself. I mean, probably a lot of people as well. It's been a while. We didn't go to Beirut. Um, based on your last survey, what is the percentage of still part of Beirut that need reconstruction? Uh, till now, and, and to, to be very honest, in our system, we have 2,000 houses that need rehabilitation. Now we went on the ground as well. We're doing the reassessment, but there is a huge need, especially with the severe damage uh, buildings or houses, uh, because no big funds came for severe and big building damages. Uh, you cannot know, honestly, I can't tell you the exact number, but there is a huge need for reconstruction as well. So I saw on your on your website you have kind of map to know the areas where you're intervening and so on. Um, but based on, I mean, are we talking that Beirut only twenty percent was rehabilitated? Uh, more, more than 20%. Uh, basically, the well-known street, Jaytewe, Marimkhayil, and Jemaize are uh, rehabilitated. You can see the streets are going back to life. But when, once you go uh, inside the streets, specifically the the, uh, the buildings, you will find... Uh, you will find misery there. Can, can I also add just something to this? Also, the issue with a lot of the rehabilitation efforts were a lot of them just did the core and shell, but the inside of the homes were actually like True. not no, nowhere close to livable in. They've lost their appliances. They've, their bathrooms are extremely destroyed. And a lot of the international organizations just did facades, you know, and funded that and put restrictions on the NGOs to say, no, we won't go into further depth because that would mean a higher allocation per home. And they wanted to close as many homes as possible. But by closing, it doesn't mean that they're actual livable spaces. And to add to what uh, the Beirut Emergency Fund did, they allocated additional funding so that the homes are actually livable. Fridges work, ovens work, because this is something that is an element of human dignity that you need to assure people with because everything else as well in terms of appliances is also in fresh cash, keep in mind, so. so the video I may up. add as well, um, we didn't just do that. Actually, we refused to do core and shell. Um, we, we wanted to do less, but do, you know, livable homes. And in some cases we took whole streets and whole buildings and we did actually the, the building with it because the building was not, not functional, the stairs or the elevator. So we also contributed in, in some cases to the rehabilitation of the building, but we refused to do core and shell. We, we rejected these uh, proposals. So at the end of the day, actually our numbers could have been much higher in True. terms of homes, homes rehabilitated, but we are not doing it for numbers. We're doing it really to bring people back to their homes. Uh, Maruna, I have a question for you. Um, do you think the local initiatives like Bait Nabaita have an advantage versus international charities? Uh, yes, we have many, many advantages. I think uh, the, f the first time I met Zena, uh, she was so surprised. They, they gave her a call, I think, and they told us to come to and see Bait Nabaita. What a grassroots movement. We're so energetic. Uh, we're so happy to help our people. We used to, you know, for, for me, I used to be a scout for the past 27 years. So, uh, and the whole team works in social work and uh, and the, the civil society work. So yeah, there is a huge advantages for grassroots movements. Uh, we are energetic. We, uh, we care about the human dignity. We are efficient and we are transparent. So for example, now, uh, let's say in two days, you can go to the website of Beit Nabeit, like you will find the auditing report that Tara, for example, is requesting from us for life and for all the donors. You will have it on the website, detailed, uh, detailed report. Everybody is telling me why you are putting uh, the, the financial report on the website. We don't hide. Oops. We have internet cuts. Uh, also, another challenge that we're facing right now is the generators aren't able to actually comprehend the hours of the day because the electricity is not there. So they have to put them to sleep for a few hours and then get them back on. 
just uh, for, for the interest of time, because there's only 20 minutes left, Rawad, maybe we can- Sorry, sorry, I'm uh, back. No, it's okay, but just there's 20 minutes left and okay. maybe Rawad, we can cover the medical side. Noor, Noor um, thanks for joining. Um, you're on mute, oh, you're not anymore. Thanks for joining Noor, uh, thanks for all your efforts on the ground. Um, we're, we're very proud of what you're achieving and I know it's, uh, it's only the start of the journey because we're, we're, we're going through a very difficult um, phase on the healthcare issue. And as well, as you were mentioning, I mean, Tara was mentioning as well, the exodus of the healthcare professionals, doctors, nurses, um, education. So um, I'll leave it to you uh, probably to, to present to us uh, Lebanon needs and then uh, go through the actual and the current situation and what's next. Of course. Thank you, Dawad. Thank you for inviting me to be part of the panel and thank you everyone for joining. So Lebanon Needs was founded in 2019 to support people on the healthcare level. We, amongst uh, 1,200 registered NGOs in Lebanon, only 700 are active and only few address healthcare, of which the Lebanese Red Cross, Amel Association and L'Ordre de Malte. So we created a decentralized system that helps people with chronic diseases with their medications every single month based on selection and vulnerability criteria. We strongly believe in a people-centric approach addressing the three social determinants of health, which are housing, food, and healthcare with partners, because prevention is the best and most sustainable medicine. Our holistic model is, uh, looks at the whole system so that it can better support end beneficiaries. We aim to preserve the Lebanese ecosystem and initiate the building blocks of circular economic systems while using and encouraging locally made products to preserve and favor employment and investments in Lebanon. Uh, so we make sure that, that patients are being followed up on by specialty doctors and are being tested periodically according to international standards, have access to their chronic medications, and that no one is falling through the gaps because of access barriers like funds or inability to commute. A few facts and figures. In 2018, according to the Fullman Report, Lebanon ranked 33rd amongst the 195 countries in the healthcare access and quality. It ranked first among all Middle East countries and recorded the best performance among high middle socioeconomic index countries in terms of HAQ index, along with Saudi Arabia and Turkey. Also, Lebanon's life expectancy at birth is 76.28 years, the third highest in the Middle East after the UAE and Qatar. The August 4th explosion put forward how bad the situation was before the blast. So let's take a step back to evaluate the full deterioration of the healthcare sector for the past year, touching all of the stakeholders. The determinants of the situations are the financial crisis and economic depression affecting everyone in the sector, agents, distributors, primary healthcare centers, hospitals, pharmacies, and eventually patients with shortages and black markets, and the impending doom of subsidizations being lifted, which is hanging by a thread. COVID pushed an already overextended system to its limits, and finally the explosion broke it. There are alarming examples of what we witnessed in the past years with patients that are coming into our care. We've met people that, has, that have been taking antibiotics for over three years. Others that were last assessed by doctors in 2018. Both of these could be explained by lack of means and or education or fear. There was also a patient that had been taking three different kinds of blood thinners for years, and so many others with many drug, drug interactions that we had to reassess. The problem is that they get to us or to hospitals when it's almost too late, and they're in need of drastic measures like dialysis or amputation, when their problems could have been easily solved by quick and inexpensive fixes, like switching their medications and improving their diet. It's basically too expensive for chronic disease patients to buy their medications, if they find them today. Over the past year, Lebanon Needs has helped over 1,600 patients with medical attention, labs, and chronic medications. We helped 17 hospitals, two paramedic, uh, two paramedic associations, and a medical waste treatment facility with PPE during our first, first COVID-19 campaign in May 2020. We contributed to the rehabilitation of Kahantina Hospital, Jaitawi Hospital, and are now rolling out the Hoser rehabilitation according to their needs and specifications, as well as the support of dispensaries and diagnostic centers as part of the Together de Beirut blast response. We also recently launched the Stronger Together campaign with partners Baitna Baitak, Khadad Beirut, Shabi Mas'uliyati, the Volunteer Circle, Ahla Fawda Shriq, 
and with the guidance of the Order of Nurses in Lebanon, the International Lebanese Medical Association, and with the support of Impact Lebanon, Life, Seal, and Beirut Emergency Fund to support patients and hospitals on January 22nd. The pillars of this campaign are the following. It's all about a unified marketing communication campaign across all platforms that include pandemic awareness and risk of misinformation, the public's concerns, and the vaccine. It also supports patients at home by training and empowering decentralized COVID-19 task forces set up by local health committees in partnership with municipalities. Doctors will triage patients into mild, moderate, and severe cases to transfer them to the appropriate channel. Mild and moderate cases will be managed at home and severe cases redirected to a hospital in their vicinity. We will also be supporting them post-discharge with O2 concentrators. Finally, we also supported 23 peripheral hospitals all over Lebanon who already had been treating COVID-19 patients and have the, the infrastructure to increase their ICU bed capacity with the following immediate needs of reusable equipment like the high flow nasal cannula, ventilators and perishable equipment like the personal protective equipment or PPE. So far, so a month into the campaign, we already purchased 177 oxygen concentrator, bringing the total number of oxygen concentrators of the campaign with Beit Nabaitak up to 350. We purchased locally manufactured PPE to encourage the local economy, but also protect healthcare workers the way they should be protected. We also started a pilot for municipality training in Demwood, and the whole program will be rolling out uh, this week. Hospital equipment that we were able to fundraise for and will be delivered, most of them, by the end of this week are three advanced portable ventilators, 44 high flow nasal cannulas, which will be saving the life of over a thousand patients all over Lebanon over the next six months. It might seem like COVID slowed down in Lebanon, but hospitals today are still full. The British strain is more aggressive and more severe than the others, and way less people are getting tested. Also, the numbers are being pushed down, but as soon as the country uh, opens up, everything would be back to higher numbers. So we really need to, you know, stay aware and awake on all of that. It's not done yet. We still need the following. 36 high flow nasal cannulas, 10 ICU ventilators, seven portable ventilators, one month worth of PPE, and nurses' salaries for the municipalities. One of the hospitals we delivered high flow nasal cannula to with 10 free kits was already concerned about what he would have to do once the 10 kits that are averaging $150 each would be used and how he would have to charge the patients. Which kind of brings us to the fact that what we're doing is not enough and it will never be enough. What we need to look at is sustainability impact on the human factor, the cost to keep these donated materials, equipment, walls, and all of that maintained, running and up to standards with the devaluation of the Lebanese pound. And most importantly, at the service of the people who need it the most. Are these donated meds, equipment, supplies being charged to the patients or deducted from the fees? Because it's always tricky donating and helping private institutions that are businesses at the end of the day. Also, the true losses or cost of the past year can only be evaluated in terms of human capital. We all know about the victims of the blast, the disease, the critically injured, and everyone who lost their homes and who, needed, and who still needs psychological support. But we also have people leaving the country, similar to what happened in the 70s and 90s in Lebanon. We have over 300 specialized doctors and nurses leaving, seeking security, financial stability, career growth, and other opportunities. The impact on the patients is basically the generating quality of services. And I wonder how many of the COVID deaths occurred because of the loss of competent doctors and nurses, because the ratio of nurses or medical doctors to patients are less than optimal and because the medications are not available. While assessing the healthcare and hospital needs for the Stronger Together campaign, I've had conversation with medical doctors on the brink of breakdown. Those medical doctors who stayed in the country for various reasons and in the midst of a worldwide pandemic that is COVID-19 have to do the impossible. They have to treat an average of 15 patients in the hospital, twice as many on the phone. They have to send patients back home with severe lack of oxygen just because they don't have space to treat them. They also have to fight with the administration of their hospitals every single day because they're increasing ER borders or jump beds to honor their Hippocratic oath that is, I will apply for the benefit of the sick all measures that are required. 
They also need to keep up to date with all of the new protocols and care methods while knowing pertinently well that close to none of these are available in Lebanon. They kind of have an impossible task and it's, it's just impossible to deal with. Today, we need to revisit the system together. We need reforms to kickstart a, sustainably, a sustainable locally made solution that isn't just injecting money and hoping for the best. Healthcare is a right. It is everywhere in the world. And it shouldn't be tackled as a privilege for a happy few where insurances, hospitals, agents, and distributors make a lot of money. The NSSF, Social Security, reimbursement plan for 30% of the, of the population, that was in 2018, today it's definitely less. Uh, because of the raising rates of unemployment, this needs to be revisited. We've had people on minimum wage begging for help with monthly medication that cost more than they make and that haven't been reimbursed for the past seven years. So we need to figure out a single entry system where healthcare fraud cannot be committed, where adopting technology for a streamlined and easy process is there, where needs are addressed in a timely manner, where patients are followed up on according to international standards for prevention, where healthcare providers are retributed fairly and equitably, including hospitals, pharmacies, nurses, and doctors. Do you know that nurses in Lebanon today get less than $200 every single month? for a job that requires them to stand on their feet over 12 hours. And sustainability needs to be factored in at every single step of this whole thing. The reconstruction of hospitals will be over in a few months. The COVID crisis will alleviate once more than 70% of the world's population will be vaccinated. Even if we're very optimistic, that won't be before the end of 2022 in the least. The recovery of the healthcare sector in Lebanon, however, and that's what we should be looking at here, will take years and substantial means and the participation of all stakeholders, suppliers, agents, manufacturers, hospitals, primary healthcare centers, pharmacies, insurances, that should not be taken on without the participation of the state. And maybe this, all of these hardships matched with our efforts can be viewed as an opportunity, as a tabula rasa, a reset button to rebuild better. Hopefully. No, the sorry. opportunity, sorry. Sorry, the opportunity we have today in investing in locally made products and exporting them, telling their stories and consuming them is incredible. The devaluation of the Lebanese pound made imported products too expensive and the cost of labor for the first time in decades is competitive with that of neighboring countries, opening up much, much needed export opportunities. Today, we as Lebanese need to review our social contracts with each other and with our country. Whether we reside in Lebanon or abroad, we need to work together into achieving these goals that we all learned and ideate towards. We need to find ways to turn our beneficiaries into partners and act on it so that we don't foster another generation of assisted and dependent citizens. Thanks, Noor. Um, we cannot, be, we cannot not be emotional when we hear what you just said about the situation, mainly when it is affecting the health of the people and the, the, the dire situation. Thanks for your efforts on the ground. It's very um, insightful. I have to switch to Zena to probably to close with Zena about the life projects other than the humanitarian is a big part at the moment, but probably the other projects that are led. Uh, thanks, Noor. Thanks very much. Zena, to you. Yeah, I'll be very quick um, and do it in nine minutes. Um, so on top of the Beirut Emergency Fund, we've actually um, decided to support more actively SMEs in Lebanon. Uh, so from the Beirut Emergency Fund, uh, raised through the Emergency Fund, we actually allocated $600,000 only to support SMEs in Lebanon beyond rehabilitation. And that includes um, capacity building, business support, legal support, uh, equipping them with machinery, um, uh, damaged stock, et cetera. So this is part of the Beirut Emergency Fund, but this is really targeted to uh, SMEs in Lebanon. And we've done this um, in partnership with Together Li Beirut, which is actually the umbrella NGO uh, that uh, Lebanon needs is part of. Um, so that's one part of the SME support we've done. We've just been, um, LIFE has just received a, a, a donation of $300,000 from Facebook to uh, distribute to vulnerable businesses across Lebanon in, um, in form of grants. So we're working very closely with Tara and her team 
to identify the very vulnerable businesses, like really uh, the businesses um, that haven't really received any support recently because all the money went for the blast um, victims. Uh, so the grants will be up to three thousand uh, dollars, you know, across the country. It could be farmers, it could be um, strategic uh, industries. So again, to support them to stay on their feet until there's some form of normality that comes back to to the country. Um, another uh, grant we received also from two large French corporates um, to support uh, rehabilitation of restaurants in Lebanon. So I'm, I'm saying this is on top of the Beirut Emergency Fund uh, to support rehabilitation of restaurants and uh, Lebanese designers. Um, and actually there's a few more corporates in the pipeline who might be uh, donating to support uh, specifically the um, creative sector in Lebanon. So we're working very uh, hard on that. Um, um, the, before I get into the life initiatives on job creation, I want to say also one thing we did after the blast is we've um, paired uh, 15 SMEs in the creative sector with 15 with uh, 30 consultants from Bain, Lebanese consultants from Bain, um, on a pro bono basis, obviously, to give them um, pro bono consultancy services for a period of six months to really help them think about their business plans and scale, uh, improve their operational efficiency, uh, export, uh, fundraise, etc. So this is something we've done in December last year, and we're looking to replicate it with other uh, consultancy firms to other sectors. Because I think today, if you help businesses in Lebanon um, scale and export, I think this is really at the heart of job creation. I mean, the way I see job creation today, is mainly two things, is outsourcing jobs to Lebanon, and I'm going to touch on that uh, in a bit, and exporting, because I don't think the local demand is going to be enough to generate enough jobs. I mean, uh, job preservation is, is difficult enough. Uh, I don't think there will be a lot of locally driven uh, jobs in Lebanon. So I just spoke about the effort to uh, SMEs and to help them um, scale and export. Um, now on the outsourcing front, we um, we have a budget this year of around two hundred thousand dollars to support specifically uh, job creation in tech because these are the easiest jobs to outsource to Lebanon. So we support uh, two coding schools, Kodi and SE Factory, who train um, students from all the way from very um, you know underprivileged backgrounds to uh, more middle class backgrounds, but they really train them to be ready for the job market, the, the global job market in tech. So they, um, it's a mostly a software development um, curriculum. So we support them in grants, we give them grants because they're social enterprises. We give them, uh, we mentor them, but we also give them access to our network uh, to help them place their graduates uh, into jobs. 50% of their graduates have um, are actually working with companies outside of Lebanon. So they, so, you know, their jobs are being outsourced to Lebanon. The other social enterprise that we support is called BOT. Uh, BOT is um, also a social enterprise that basically trains very marginalized youth from different communities uh, across Lebanon on digital skills. And then they staff them on a project basis. So uh, it could be you know, anything from data cleaning, data entry, market survey. So again, I would like to raise the profile of these enterprises among our members because a lot of times actually our members want to outsource to Lebanon the, you know, the kind of back office type of uh, rules. So if they can contact me, I can put them in touch with the OT. Um, so again, we, we've given them a grant, uh, mentorship and access to our network. Last but not least, uh, we also support Holberton Academy. Um, it's a Silicon uh, Valley-based academy that uh, teaches uh, deep tech. So it's everything from blockchain to machine learning to AR, um, AI, etc. Uh, again, it's because we want to upskill the youth to be ready for outsourcing, uh, more outsourcing job opportunities in Lebanon. The other um, initiative we're also part of is, I'm sure you've all heard, heard of it, it's the Jobs for Lebanon. 
uh, which is a, a platform that encourages the diaspora to post jobs for Lebanese. And we, um, we've been partner with them since last year. And we've allocated some life ambassadors to them that help them in the outreach to uh, the diaspora. So I did it in actually seven minutes. <laughs> it's very lot of information. I, I win the price of speed. <laughs> actually, uh, you, uh, you, uh, you mentioned a lot of topics actually, but I think the one um, I would like to, to just to echo what you said about the job creation in tech, I think it's something that we should uh, within life promote more because I think there's, uh, there's talent, uh, there's, I don't want to say cheap, but let's say it's affordable um, talent because at the moment, if you look to the tech industry, it is where I think you can easily outsource a lot of people, as you mentioned, probably we can think within life about having a kind of catalog of services we can distribute to all the members, probably within their job, they can access to some, I would say ad hoc or, or um, on the menu, some tasks that can be done via the tech. Um, thank, thanks, thanks very much, Zena. Can I, I just say something on this, Rawad, because this is very important. I think what we're lacking today is companies to whom people can outsource, because it's easier to outsource to a company than to hire uh, graduates remotely and have to manage them you know, from far. And this is something I'm working on actually with SE Factory um, as we speak, is basically push them to really create a company that, that can take projects on behalf of clients, manage the projects and staff people on them. Because if you don't do that, I don't think we're gonna have uh, outsourcing en masse. You need a structure to make sure exactly. in, terms of, in terms of transparency, in terms of follow-up on the ground, you would need that. Exactly. I, thanks. I have a last question for Tara. I don't know if it's something that I think we, I know we're run out of time, but about vaccination, is it still only going through the government or there's any alternatives or any uh, parallel initiative to the vaccination in Lebanon? The question will go to Noor, actually. Okay, so it's we are not able to purchase the vaccine at any point right now. And even importers are not able to sell it or get it. They can only get it to give it to the government. However, uh, some political parties got some donated. It's um, either the Russian or the Chinese vaccine, and they have been vaccinating, um, you know, people from the party. Okay. Okay. <laughs> As usual, in Lebanon, there's always... Um, um, one, one last thing about, I mean, Tara, uh, just to sum up what you mentioned, I have a lot of messages coming up. A lot of people are impressed of what's happening on the ground. Thanks, Maroon. Thanks, Noor. I mean, it's impressive and we're really proud of what you're doing on the ground. And as I said, it's a shame for any other uh, official organization in Lebanon. Um, compare on the efforts you're having with, with really short staff and short limited uh, fund. Tara, one last question. If you, via life, what do you think we, I mean, you said a lot of things can be done. Definitely a lot of people were generous. We're trying to to raise funds via our organization and even with our, within our companies and so on. But what do you think we should do to make sure that we can access some more visibility on the international uh, official organization to help us more? And this fund would go directly to NGOs. So I, I uh, commented on this question that was raised. Um, so the, the issue with international funding is usually when it's given, it's given in very big amounts. So they don't give small grants because it's much more tedious to do so. If they're going to be giving in the hundreds of thousands or in the millions, they need to uh, be certain that the recipient is able to comprehend this amount of funding. And when we talk about the ability to comprehend, it comes with a lot of resources that are needed. One of them being staff. And a lot of the times, uh, the local NGOs aren't able to retain the expertise in staff due to the lack of funding that comes in for the overhead costs, right? So they usually put them on project basis and then they'd have to leave, even though they would have invested heavily in their trainings and so on. With international organizations, so the way it's done is the foreign government identifies international uh, uh, offices uh, they could be the equivalents to Oxfam, Save the Children, the UN agencies, who already have a very, very uh, equipped team in place. 
that you pay for. Because if you look at really the main difference amongst them, amongst the many differences, is the fact that today when you donate $100 to a local NGO, uh, up to $80 to $90 goes directly to the ground. Their overhead costs don't usually overgo 15% as opposed to international organizations where you have between 30 to 50% of the actual operational costs going into the staff, right? So we need to promote them more. One of the things that LIFE uh, has partnered with recently is also the Fondation pour le Liban, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, and so they, they're launching hopefully in the next few weeks officially, whereby they're creating an official crowdfunding platform for Lebanon that is also with certified um, in terms of due diligence and monitoring by 3QA. Uh, in order to expose these uh, organizations, people get tax exemptions because that's also another element that people would like to do when we talk about large amounts uh, that we don't have today. So today, if you donate to a local NGO in Lebanon, you, we don't have the mechanism of tax exemption which also creates another level of demotivation for the donor because especially in the private or the corporate world. So there are multiple things that we can work on. Um, try to think about the ways in which you could support local organizations through these different platforms, whether they're live, Fondacio or others, uh, in order you know, to, to, to keep encouraging, but also keep tracking. So it's not just an open-ended support, but it's a targeted support. Excellent. Thanks, Tara. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks for the panelists. Um, Nin, Tara, Noor, Maroon, you're doing an excellent job. We're all proud of your doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for the participants as well. And um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.